Welcome to Follow to Lead, where we discover how to listen for and follow God's call so that we might lead others to God. Our shared stories of inspiration from religious leaders and those active in the educational ministry of the church can help you know better how God is calling you and the role passionate Catholic education plays in spreading His message of faith, hope, and love. Now please welcome the hosts of Follow to Lead, Father Randy Sly and Kyle Pietrantonio. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Christ the Teacher, teach us to listen. Teach us to do the deep listening to the sounds of our soul, waiting to hear your voice calling us to cast out deeper, to become fishers of men and women, shepherds of souls, to follow your will in order to lead others to the truth, beauty, and goodness only you can offer. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Welcome to Follow to Lead, a journey twice a month into the world of Catholic education and our faith, and exploring what it means to follow God in order to lead others to Him. I'm Father Randy Sly, your host, and today we will be talking with Dr. Tom Harmon, the Associate Director of Catholic Studies at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, and in cooperation with Bishop Barron's Word on Fire Institute, UST has established a new master's in evangelization and culture degree, which will be the main topic of our conversation today. Now, Dr. Harmon is professor and Scanlon Foundation Chair of Theology, as well as the Associate Director of Catholic Studies at UST in Houston. He received both his master's and Ph.D. in theology from Ave Maria University. He is a Catholic speaker, a noted author on the subject of St. Augustine and political philosophy, theology, and media, and is an occasional film and TV reviewer. As director of UST's new Master of Arts in Evangelization and Culture, he's eager to help students bring together the richness of uh, the Catholic intellectual tradition with cutting-edge knowledge of media in the service of sharing the gospel. Dr. Harmon resides in Sugarland, Texas, with his wife and five children, and in his spare time, he enjoys playing pickleball with his friends in between injuries. I always thought of that intriguing last statement, <laughs> Tom, so you're going to have to tell us about—no, don't tell us about your injuries, but uh, we're glad that you look like you're in pretty good health today. Oh, uh, uh, Tom, welcome to the program. Thank you, Father. It's great being here. And we're really glad that you could join us. Uh, we always like to begin our program by giving our guests an opportunity to tell us a little bit about themselves. So could you fill us in a little bit on your upbringing? Sure. I grew up in the Archdiocese of Seattle, um, a couple miles north of the city in a little town called Bothell. And I went to Catholic schools my um, my whole upbringing from first grade all the way through Ph.D., um, my, I'm a cradle Catholic. Um, my parents were very involved in the church, um, in the archdiocese and, um, uh, my mother worked, worked for the chancery and both my, my, my mom and my dad were very involved in the pro-life movement. And so, um, I got to, to see their activities, um, in the pro-life movement, um, especially in the, the anti-euthanasia campaigns in the 1990s, which uh -huh. unfortunately didn't go our way. Um, but, um, I, I'm also the oldest of five kids, so um, I've got five kids. I was one of five, and um, uh, when I went to college, I just skipped across the mountains to Gonzaga, and um, I was there when Father Spitzer was president. Oh, and, wonderful! Um, so he was uh, he he was a, a big influence on on how I ended up viewing things. Um, and uh, um, after that, I went to Ave Maria for. Um, for, for graduate studies, although in between there, um, <laughs> uh, I was actually director of campus leadership and um, uh, membership at the Intercollegiate Studies Institute for a year. Um, and then I tried to be a freelance journalist for a year, which was a miserable failure. So um, uh, anyway, um, so that, that sort of <laughs> brings me up to the academic career, I guess. And uh, so I'm a, a Western Washington native. And um, uh, somehow I ended up in South Florida and then uh, Houston. So you decided to stay warm and stay south. Uh, I guess I did, or it was decided for me by Providence. <laughs> there you go. That's that is so good. And uh, 
So it's exciting to hear about uh, Father Spitzer's uh, influence on your life. Would he? Would you kind of credit him as being the one that kind of led you on a trajectory toward uh, being uh, in higher education? Uh, yeah, he was the first one who really turned me on to the intellectual life. Um, I took uh, uh, I took a course from him when I was a sophomore called Faith Faith and Reason, and um, uh, he's. <laughs> Uh, that was when he was starting to work on his um, his books on that subject also. Uh -huh. So I, I guess I was um, uh, one of the, the test audience for, um, say, his Contemporary Proofs for the Existence of God book and um, some of the other related books he's written in the interim. Um, but um, but not only um, not only in his teaching and his life as a scholar, but also um, just kind of observing how he steered. Uh, or attempted to steer uh, a somewhat wayward Catholic institution uh, was an education in itself. So watching the challenges that he faced at, at a Jesuit university um, really helped me see what some of the um, the challenges in the, in the church at large were. Um, I made lots of friends there who were um, uh, working on on uh, you know, basically projects for evangelization um, uh, while we were uh, uh, college students uh, with whom I've kept in touch over the years. Um, and so uh, Father Spitzer really created a, um, a space for us to do that kind of work of evangelization. And so um, he was uh, influential not only in my decision to go into an academic vocation, but also um, or really uh, set the stage for me to think uh, more seriously about uh, evangelization, especially in um, uh, an academic institution. So when this opportunity for this uh, degree program came about, I bet you were hungry to latch on and, and become mm -hmm. a part of it, it sounds like. Yeah, that's right. Um, so this has been in the works for a couple of years now. Um, Bishop Barron was our commencement speaker a few years ago, and that's when the conversation started. Um, and it was uh, it was really in the fall that um, both my administration and um, the Word on Fire Institute uh, approached me to to direct the program, and I was enthusiastic to say the least. So um, I think it's got a lot of promise, and um, I'm excited to see where it goes. That's fantastic. You know. Uh... It sounds like a, a very unique and cutting edge approach. But before we really get into the program itself, I want to kind of get into some semantics. One of the things in the promotional materials that I came across is it said that this comes out of the word on fire evangelization ethos. What what do you mean by that? What does that look like? Mm -hmm. So um, I should say, uh, first of all, that I. Um, um, I, I don't speak for for Word on Fire, so we're there are partners, but um, uh, I'm only speaking really for for UST. Um, but um, uh, since I'm, I'm directing this master's program, um, uh, and one of the things that attracted me to the master's program was this ethos that Word on Fire has, and um, uh, yeah, I mean if you if you if you've noticed, um, there's a there's a, a problem in the church with um, people leaving, and um, there's uh, the rise of the nuns, um, which has yeah. been well documented. Um, and um, I think that that Bishop Barron has become one of the foremost communicators and evangel evangelizers in the church uh, because of a combination, uh, a, a sort sort of unique combination of abilities. Um, and formation that he's had. Um, first of all, I think that he's a master of new media, um, and he's he's able to um, to it, almost intuit uh, what the different types of medium um, are best suited for, what kinds of messages, how to express himself, um, and uh, he's also um, a very keen observer of the co contemporary scene. Um, and so he knows his audience very well. Um, and you know, part of being an evangelizer is being a practiced rhetorician. You have to know uh, what sorts of messages people will receive and what, what they won't. And you have to know where to start and where not to start. And you have to know where the real issues are. And um, he's the best at that in the church in America, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, 
and so that's that was the first thing is um is his mastery of uh the medium uh, of communication um the second thing though was um his you know the, the first time i even heard of bishop baron was when i was at gonzaga actually and a friend of mine had just started listening to him and reading his writing and was astonished that there was this guy who was seemingly you know perfectly orthodox uh, to whom people across um, many different persuasions you would say in the church um, gave a gave a hearing um, so he was able to speak to the many disparate um, even warring elements in the American church um, in a way that was um, winsome um, full of uh, humor and goodwill um, and so that's the second thing is his manner um, his openness um, he has you know a spine of steel when he needs to um, as I think we've seen with some of his recent um, messages about uh, uh, things that are happening in in American politics um, but uh, but he knows that um, just because you disagree about something doesn't mean that you have to be um, hostile or enemies mm -hmm. Um, the third thing, though, is that he's got this idea of the seeds of the word, um, which is, of course, an ancient idea, but um, but he's the one who uses it best, I think, nowadays. And that's the, the idea there is that um, all of creation is God's creation. And so um, everywhere in creation, you're going to see uh, little um, seeds of um, his word that, if cultivated, will grow up into something beautiful. And so he's constantly on the lookout for the good in um, any area where he looks. And it's that, um, uh, that, that, that sort of positivity and that interest in finding the good, even where it might be unexpected, um, that I think is attractive right now. One of the things that intrigues me about the degree, and I think it was probably intentional, is it wasn't just a master's in evangelization, which would almost make it abstract or conceptual but it's a master's in evangelization and culture. In other words, there's a context that has to be studied as well. Would that be accurate? No, that's exactly right. It's exactly, and the context is ex is exactly what um, uh, the one who's preaching the gospel needs in order to do so effectively. Um, so you ha you have to know what sorts of things shape your audience, and it's culture that shapes your audience. And by culture, we would mean anything from popular enter entertainment and art to politics um, to the media itself. And so you have to be aware of all of those things. So with uh, Word on Fire, I know that they also they have an institute that has um, an online program. Is the master's you are developing, is this uh, 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 an in-class program at UST? Is it online is it a hybrid what what kind of offering are you are you having with this we call it a low residency master's program which means that most of it is online um but um it's live online in other words it's like what you and i are doing right now um so a lot of uh i've i've taught courses especially during the pandemic that were what we call asynchronous that is they're not live um, and um, there's just something that's deficient about those uh, those approaches. We think um, this sort of um, this sort of setting um, it works well, uh, especially for graduate students. Now I said mm -hmm. low residency though because most only most of it is, is online. There's also going to be we hope uh, an in-person component every summer with the week-long residency that's going to be kind of like a very intense conference on evangelization and culture that we have every year. And so that's not required for every student, but we really hope that all of our students are able to join us for at least one of those during the program. I like the idea that it's not asynchronous but live because uh, it's that way you have actually other people to interact with, and so it's not just a talking head. Is that that kind of what you're looking for? That's right. Um, we want we want our students to have a relationship with not only their professors, but with fellow students in the program. Um, we're hoping that uh, not only will people learn things in our classes, but that they'll they'll develop friendships and that perhaps partnerships uh, will come out of the program. And um, having that um, 
having that experience every year where everybody has the opportunity to come together, I think is going to be very important for, you know, developing fellow feeling among the the, the faculty and the students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. Uh, there would be some perhaps that might argue that evangelization is something that is more caught than taught, uh, uh, that, you know, you have to kind sure. of come alongside somebody and all that. Uh, is, are there some types of practicum or practica involved in this program? Well, as you might imagine, uh, there will be lots of different types of students. So people are interested in the program for lots of different reasons. Some people are interested in it just because they want to know more about theology um, and they love Bishop Barron's approach. But some people will be interested in the program because they're involved in evangelization, either directly through the church or through some apostolate or uh, just because, as you say, that they're that kind of person. Um, and for those students, we are going to be offering the, the option to use a capstone or, or we have a capstone at the end. Um, uh, to, to, to do a practical project, which uh, would be in concert with or under the direction of somebody who's involved in evangelization in that area. Mm -hmm. um, so th there will be uh, that option for people who are involved more in um, practical evangelization. We will also have a couple classes that are more practical as well, that, that will be more about doing than about learning what other people have done. So uh, with our audience here on Follow to Lead, which is mostly uh, Catholic school administrators, educators, staff members, and all of that, would uh, there be a benefit for, say, uh, a, a teacher or an administrator to uh, to be involved in a master's program like this? Would there be application to, let's say, a school setting? That you could see? Uh, yes, of course. Um, as a matter of fact, I've already admitted a couple of school teachers into the program. Um, I think that um, uh, I think that a lot more uh, teachers and school administrators these days are looking at the mission of their school to be one that's involved directly with evangelization. Um, I think this is this is what official church, church documents say about our Catholic schools is that uh -huh. they are supposed to be places of evangelization. Um, but um, as you know, and as many of your listeners know, that's not usually uh, an official or explicit component in an education degree. Um, and so uh, this could be a very valuable supplement um, for people who are wondering, how do I turn my school into something that is more like one that the church would ask of it? And what are the prerequisites for admission? Mm -hmm. So uh, all we require is a bachelor's degree and a 3.0 GPA um, in uh, whatever level that you took last. So uh -huh. um, we anticipate that many people from different walks of life will be interested. So our, um, our cohort will include people who are just out of college um, and uh, some people who were theology majors. But um, my last conversation was with a lawyer. Um, and my next conversation is with someone who works in the oil and gas industry. So um, I think I think there's a place for for people, no matter what you majored in in college. That's yeah. It seems to me that uh, the breadth and of application is is almost exponential because whatever it is that is your background or your context that that you can apply uh, the skills and knowledge that you get through a program like this. So how long is the program? How much time uh, does it take an individual to go through? Um, we anticipate that most students will complete it in two years. Um, it's designed for people who have full-time jobs. So um, the pace is going to be more manageable for, for those folks. Um, a, a typical residential master's program that is roughly the number of credits that ours is, 33 credits, would usually last a year, maybe a, a little bit more than a year. But, um, uh, but, but we anticipate that our students will probably take something more like two classes a term. And at that pace, they should be able to finish within two years. Although, we also know that some students will have more demanding jobs or family life. And so the pace is actually variable 
for the students. So if you want to take one class a term, or if you would like um, to do um, to, to skip a term here and there because life gets particularly uh, busy, um, that will also be an option. So we want to make the program as um, accessible as we can for the people who want it the most. I really think that's a, a great advantage for this program is to uh, kind of tailor it uh, to the, the lifestyles of the people involved. That's one of the beauties of technology that you can really do that rather than just expect somebody to move down there spend two years and then and then leave plus their practicum can take place within the context of what they're doing and and for a faculty is it ust is it word on fire is it a hybrid are you bringing in others where are your resources yeah it's both really um so we're utilizing many of the word on fire institute uh fellows um so in the fall for instance um we have dr richard de um, who's an institute fellow who's going to be teaching uh, the theology of Bishop Robert Barron for us. Um, in the spring, Dr. Holly Ordway will be teaching uh, the course on reading for evangelists. Um, but there will also be, um, oh, I, sh I should mention Todd Werner will be one of our faculty members as well. Uh, Dr. Chris Kayser and um, uh, Matthew Petrusik himself. Um, uh, so, so we're going to be utilizing Word on Fire uh, faculty, but also UST faculty. I'm going to be the one leading the uh, the in-person intensive in the summer. Um, in June, we're launching, actually our first official course will be Dante the Evangelist, which will be taught by one of my UST colleagues here, uh, Dr. Dominic Aquila. So we're excited to sort of combine forces. Oh, that that first course sounds really intriguing. Uh, yeah. to see Dante as an evangelist. I love yeah. that. That yeah. is that is super. So if people want to give uh, more attention to this program, where where can they go? Yeah, sure. Um, there are, because it's a partnership program, uh, there are actually two websites that they can go to. Um, the first one is on uh, Word on Fire's website. And so that's just um, institute.wordonfire.org slash ma-evangelization-n-culture. <laughs> okay. um, or you can just Google Word on Fire Institute MA Evangelization and Culture and their page will pop up immediately. Um, or you can go to the University of St. Thomas website and look under our uh, graduate programs in um, the School of Arts and Sciences, and um, the link will appear there. And we have a landing page set up with all of the basic information. Um, but if people want to email me, that would be fine. My email address is my last name, H-A-R-M-O-N-T-P at S-T-T-H-O-M dot E-D-U. Or they can email admissions at S-T-T-H-O-M dot E-D-U as well. Okay, very good. And uh, it I would assume that your first cohort is is forming right now. Is there still room? Uh, there is still room. Um, <laughs> I, I keep telling people it's funny that um, when I proposed this program to our administration, um, I, I made the case that it would be sustainable with 15 students in the first cohort. And we, we, we got 15 students, we, we got 15 applications in the first 18 hours. So, oh um, so we've had yeah. a lot more, <laughs> uh, we've had a lot of interest, um, but I'm pretty committed to two things. First, um, I want to keep our class size capped at 20. So there won't be any classes we offer with more than 20 students. But second, I'm also pretty committed to making sure that if I think an applicant is capable of completing the program successfully, um, I want to be able to admit that student. And so um, it, instead of, um, uh, instead of uh, you know, denying applications, what I'm going to, to, to look to doing is adding class sections. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so yes, there is still room. Um, and there's room both for uh, the summer and for the fall. Um, although we've got, I mean, you know, if you're going to be in this initial cohort, it will be a nice big group with uh, lots of friends to make. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And is is there financial aid that would be available in for interested students? Not at this point, no. Okay. That is something that we'd like to do in the future. 
Um, but I think we're going to have to graduate a few classes before we're able to, to do something like that. So you're looking for someone that might be willing to underwrite this, hopefully for the future. Well, wouldn't that be nice? Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> that is that would be a, a great thing. So in, in addition to perhaps that, what what is your long term vision for this program? What do you see this in comp accomplishing? Uh, I would like this to be the premier program in the world for thinking about evangelization and culture. Um, I want this to be a place um, of learning, um, but I also want this to be a sort of laboratory where our students are free to try out things um, and to experiment and um, to talk to the experts the relevant experts that know the most about the most important things for evangelization and culture. Um, and so I want this eventually also to be a kind of clearinghouse for ideas um, and um, practices that people can draw on. Um, so uh, I think we're, I think we're, we've got a good chance of doing that. Um, and maybe like most basic of all, um, again, it's sort of a joke, but um um, we often we, we have to tell people, you know, there's only one Bishop Robert Barron, unfortunately. Um, so the second best thing we can do is to try to um, give people the sort of training and formation he received. And so if we can't clone Bishop Barron, then at least we can have some students who are trained in his approach to theology and evangelization. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that, you know, but that really is a good idea because we can't just depend on one person. Uh, to do this work, that's for sure. That's but right. he's given us some uh, some great uh, perspective that can be passed on to others. Do you think there could be a, a possibility in years to come of uh, maybe even getting a PhD uh, or something <laughs> like that in something well, like this? The, you're not the first person to suggest it. Um, so, I mean, I'm a big fan of making sure that things grow organically. Um, and... Um, if there is a PhD that develops in the future, I think it will need to be um, because of demand from the students who go through the MA. Right. Um, so right. if there's a if there's a critical mass of MA students who really want to continue on to the highest level of graduate studies, um, then I'm certainly open to, to trying to make that happen. Um, of course, we would want our partners at Word on Fire to be excited about that as well. Sure. I think they would be, but I couldn't speak for them. <laughs> well, it sounds to me like this is, uh, a, you know, uh, an area that is is going to develop in its richness. And as you as a, a university and Word on Fire uh, as an organization continue to work together, I think that who knows what kind of uh, out of the box things can come out of this. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the, the very fact that there's so much interest um, and the, the the caliber of applicants that we're getting is very impressive. So they're very bright people, very accomplished people, very eager people. And um, I'm excited a little bit just to see what they do. Honestly, I think to some degree, um, what we're providing is a landing space for people with similar interests um, who want to do the sort of work that Bishop Barron is doing. But they're going to be different people and they're going to have ideas of their own. And I'm hoping we'll be able to help facilitate those ideas. Now, one of the other uh, things going on at uh, University of St. Thomas that to me is really cutting edge and exciting is Max Studios, uh, <laughs> your media emphasis down there. Well, are they going to be tapped a lot to be involved in uh, in this master's program? Yeah, and uh, they've already offered, as a matter of fact. And of course, our first contact with Word on Fire was um, a partnership between Word on Fire and uh, our Mac Studio program. Um, and so they were really the, the, the ones who um, initially formed a friendship between the two institutions. Um, yeah, I'm, so I'm working with um, my, my colleagues over in Mac Studios um, uh, and uh, in communication with them about ways in which they can, uh, they can be, excuse me, <clears throat> they can be involved in the program, but um, obviously one of Word on Fire's emphasis emphases is new media. Yeah, and Mac Studios is in fact doing new media, and so one of the opportunities of having this program here at UST is that we hope that our students will be able to avail themselves of the 
um, technical and artistic capabilities of our Mac Studios personnel. Um, and so they'll be able to, um, if, especially for those who are more interested in the, the practical side of evangelization, mm -hmm. um, they'll be able to show them um, how to do it. It sounds to me like uh, we've got all of the resources necessary for this to launch as a, a very strong program from the get-go. And again, if if people want to find out more, they can go to University of St. Thomas and find it there. They can go to Word on Fire Institute, or they can email you. That's and right. uh, uh, it, it's it's I, I'm very excited about this, and I think that especially uh, from the Duke and Alton Schools Collaborative perspective, where we see the uh, the Catholic school as a place of evangelization and the fulfillment of the new evangelization that uh, uh, Pope St. John Paul II uh, really keynoted for us, that this could be a great resource for teachers who have a passion to really see the renewal of souls. Um, you know, our audience, as I said earlier, is made up mostly of administrators and teachers. Uh, you've been involved in higher education. Uh, I know you have uh, children in Catholic schools. What... Um, what kind of message, what advice, what counsel uh, would you have today for our uh, our audience, those who are in the trenches right now in the Catholic school movement? Um, well, the first one would just be a message of encouragement. Um, I think that because we have access to the long tradition of Catholic education, um, there's going to be a stability to Catholic schools if they stick in some way faithfully to that tradition that secular schools won't have. Um, and so while other models of schools may be blown about here and there by the winds of ideology or, um, you know, quick fix academic trends and fads, um, I think Catholic schools have the, the, uh, the, the possibility of being um, really the foremost places of education and formation in the country. Um, and so I, I, I would just counsel um, our teachers and administrators in Catholic schools to have um, confidence in their patrimony and um, uh, not to be too bothered by the way that secular schools are going. Um, I think the time of con considering um, uh, non-Catholic education schools um, uh, to be you know, sources of uh, wisdom is probably past. I think the time to consider secular schools as aspirant institutions is probably past. Um, so I think right now what is really necessary is for us to build our institutions up and to have confidence that we actually have the, the know-how ourselves to do that. I think those are great words uh, to leave with our, uh, with our audience, especially administrators and teachers that are really on that, uh, that cutting edge. And I really want to thank you uh, so much, Tom, for being with us uh, on uh, on Follow to Lead today. Now, uh, as you know, you know one of the best ways of of building understanding is repetition. So, and I'm going to put it in the show notes. But give me the uh, website one more time, and also your email address. And I will, it, with your permission, go ahead and put those also in the show notes. Sure thing. So my email address is Harmon T P. That's H A R M O N T P at St. Tom, S T T H O M dot edu. Um, or you can also email admissions at St. Tom dot edu. Uh, and then we have the, the two websites one at the University of St. Thomas, um, which, if you go to our main page and click on our academics tab, is located under the graduate programs in arts and sciences. Um, or you can go to uh, the Word on Fire Institute homepage or uh, um, webpage. Um, and so that's institute.wordonfire.org slash ma dash evangelization dash and dash culture. Wonderful. Dr. Tom Harmon, thank you again for being our guest today on Follow to Lead. It's been a pleasure, Father. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, for more information about the Duke and Altum Schools Collaborative, I invite you to visit our website at diaschools.org. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow our podcast and be sure to leave a comment to encourage us toward future programs. May Almighty God bless you. 
We'd like to thank you for joining us on this episode of Follow to Lead, a production of the Duke and Altum Schools Collaborative. To learn more about finding your own path in your journey of faith, or for more information on what we discussed in today's episode, you are invited to follow us on social media and visit us on the web at diaschools.org. To provide a one-time donation or monthly pledge, please visit our website. Your gift will aid us in providing up-to-date information, additional resources, and other support on how to take Catholic education to a higher level. We look forward to helping you follow God's call to lead others to God right here on Follow to Lead.